If you would like to join us, turn to your hymnals number 598. Coming again. Number 213. Well. Lift up the trumpet. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, you pilgrims, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. Echo in the dark. 
And thank you for the songs. It's never complete without starting with a few songs, right? Well, you know, the Lord has a way of changing our plans sometimes. You probably noticed this is not the title that was in the program. I uh, was just praying over the day and felt impressed that this would be the one that I should share. Uh, so there must be a reason for it. Hopefully it uh, touches some heart for uh, for some reason or another. And really what this is focused on is looking at the goal of true education. Because it's easy to get caught up in the hows and the methods, and, and those are vital, They're absolutely important. We can't be without those. But if we don't know where we're going, <laughs> if we don't know what our goal is, then how are we ever going to be successful in this process of true education? So I want to look at this. And I got this title from one time I was talking about self-sacrifice, and uh, somebody pointed out to me that you can sacrifice and still be selfish. <laughs> uh, we see it in the world, you know, celebrity figures giving a bunch of money, and, you know, it's like they're, they're just trying to draw attention to themselves. But, but at an even deeper level, as I'm going to go into, we tend to often live our lives focusing on the here and now, focusing on success in this world rather than the furthering of God's kingdom. So I really want to look at understanding self-sacrifice from Jesus' perspective, looking at the example that he set and looking at it in the context of the great controversy. So with that, let's have a word of prayer and we'll start. <clears throat> our Father, as we open your word, as we look at the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and the example he set as we look at the instruction you've given us and all these, all these precious things that you've given us, Lord. We just need your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds. Please change us, convert us, help us to be focused solely on glorifying you in our lives. Father, I ask again that you'll speak through me. May I use your words and not my own. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible tells us that there was a war in heaven. We know the story. Long ago, before the earth came into existence, this war began. And a beautiful being named Lucifer became selfish. And rather than admitting that he was selfish, he accused God of that very trait. And thus began a rebellion, this whispering campaign to suggest doubts and discontent around heaven and the universe. Accusations were made regarding the fairness of the ruling power, and thus began the great controversy of which we are all a part. But really what I'd like to ask the question is, is what was the basis of the conflict? 
What was the point of the argument? What was the actual disagreement about? We read in the book Education, unselfishness. What's that word? Unselfishness. The principle of God's kingdom, like right there, there there's, a whole, there's a whole lesson right there, right? What is the principle of God's kingdom? Unselfishness. But it is the principle that Satan hates. It's very existence he denies. The very thing God has based his government upon, Satan says, that doesn't even exist. From the beginning of the great controversy, he has endeavored to prove God's principles of action to be selfish. And he deals in the same way with all who serve God. Who is this talking about? That's us, right? For serving the Lord. Satan is dealing this way with us. He's accused God of selfishness. He says unselfishness doesn't exist, and neither does it exist in your followers. To disprove Satan's claim is the work of Christ and all who bear his name. Now, there's a lot right here. We're going to look at how God's kingdom is based on unselfishness. We're going to look at how Satan hates and denies the existence of unselfishness. And we are going to see how it is the Christian's work to prove Satan wrong. So let's look at this first item on the list. God's kingdom is based on unselfishness. Turn with me to Matthew. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And verse 37. This is a familiar story to many of us. Matthew chapter 22. Verse... Actually, we'll start in verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, Jesus, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Okay, this is a lawyer, but is this a civil lawyer or a religious lawyer? It's a religious lawyer. He is an expert, supposedly, in the law of God. And he is coming to Jesus, asking the question, what is the greatest commandment of the law? Was Jesus qualified to answer that question? (laughs) This lawyer came to the right person, didn't he? This was the author of the law itself. Jesus was qualified to answer the question. So whatever Jesus' response is, (laughs) we can know it it will be correct. Jesus said unto him, here's the great commandment of the law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then Jesus says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, any government is based on what? On law. You can't have a government without law. So, God's kingdom and methods of operation are based on a law. Furthermore, we're told that this law is a transcript of God's character. We can read the law and seek to and know and understand who God is and what his character is like. And Jesus has just said that on these principles that we've just that he's just described, the law and the prophets, all the law and the prophets hang upon them. So if we want to understand the law, we can look at these two principles. And if we want to understand the character of God, we can look at these two principles because the character of God is described by the law. And according to what we just read, on what is the law based? It says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul and mind, and love thy neighbor as as thyself. In other words, Jesus says, All the law and the prophets hang upon the principle of loving someone else. All the law and the prophets hang upon the principle of unselfish love. In other words, God's character is based in unselfish love. God's character is based in a love that would leave heaven and come to die for us. That's what God's kingdom is based on. It's what he operates on. It's what he runs the universe on. Unselfish love is who God is. 
Now, it's easy enough to say that, though, right? (laughs) And God has been saying that all along. But what do you do when someone comes along and says, well, actually, there's no such thing as unselfish love? You say your government's based on it. You say that's your character, but that doesn't even exist. You're not unselfish. You're selfish, actually. What do you do? You've been saying, Demonstrate demonstrate it. Amen, brother. You see, Satan hates and denies the existence of unselfishness. We've seen a description here in the words of Jesus of the character of God based on his law. Let's hear a little description of the character of Satan. Isaiah chapter 14. Uh, Again, some verses I'm sure we're familiar with. Isaiah chapter 14, and we can look at verses 12 through 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Jesus says, I will bring myself down to the level of humanity so that I can save them. Satan, is that the principle of his government? It's like, no, I want to exalt myself. I want to beat somebody else. I want to be like God. The basis of God's government is serving someone else. The basis of Satan's government is serving myself. Now, we see this very clearly exemplified in the conversation between God and Satan in the story of Job. Go with me to Job chapter 1. Now, we know the story of Job, right? Rich guy, got all his stuff taken, destroyed. He stayed faithful to God. But I want to focus on the conversation. Job chapter 1. What does the Bible say about Job's character in verse 1? Perfect. How many of you want God to say that about you? (laughs) Perfect. Now, verse, uh, chapter 1 and verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, when you look at the, at the original text here and you understand the meaning, uh, this idea of presenting themselves is not just taking roll call. Here, here, here. No, it was much deeper than that. These were the sons of God, the representatives of the worlds around the universe who were there representing their dominions and what they stood for. They were representing governments. And you had all the governments of the universe who were based upon the principle of God's kingdom of unselfishness, except for one. Satan came into this. The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. That language used there, Satan is saying, the earth is mine. That's my dominion. It's as if Satan is here interjecting himself into this heavenly council saying, it's me again, just reminding you of my position. You all are saying your dominions are based on unselfishness, but I'm here to represent that that doesn't exist. And what does God say? Verse 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? You ever think you have a really solid argument and somebody goes, Have you thought about? And you're like, (laughs) Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Now, this word considered in the Hebrew, it's actually a combination of two words, and it is not casual in nature. It means deep reflection with an inference of considering the consequences. So what is God asking Satan here? He says, Satan, Have you had some deep reflection about Job? Have you thought about, Satan, what Job means to you and what you are claiming? Satan, do you realize that 
because there's Job, your position is wrong. Satan, think about this, God is saying. Consider this. Stop your boastful claims and consider that because Job exists, you're wrong. I don't know about you, but I want God to use me as an arguing point. I want my existence to prove Satan wrong. But that didn't stop Satan, did it? He came right back with an accusation. Verse 9, what did Satan respond? Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? What does that word not mean? Nothing. Nothing. God. (laughs) Is Job serving you for free? He's surely expecting something out of this. As a matter of fact, look at how you've blessed him, God. That's why he's serving you. In fact, God, Job proves my point, not yours. You're saying Job proves your character of unselfishness. But Satan's accusation about Job was that Job's motive of action in serving God was selfish. Do you see the problem? Both sides in this argument pointing to the same individual and saying that person proves my point. But their points are opposite. God's pointing to Job, saying, He's proving my point. Satan's pointing to Job, He's proving my point. But it's unselfishness versus selfishness. And it's reached a point where words are not going to solve this problem. Arguing will get no further. So, what does God do? He places the argument in the hands of Job. He says, I'll leave it to my servant to decide who is right in this great controversy. Friends, that's trust. God staked his honor upon his servant. And we know the story, of course, right? What was Job's course of action? Which side did it prove correct? It proved God's correct. I want my life to be the same, proving God to be correct in the great controversy. Now let's go back to what we've been reading. Unselfishness, the principle of God's kingdom, is the principle that Satan hates. Its very existence he denies. From the beginning of the great controversy, he's endeavored to prove God's principles of action to be selfish, and he deals in the same way with all who serve God. That's what he did there in the story of Job. To disprove Satan's claim is the work of Christ and all who bear his name. You see, in this great controversy, a third of the angels believed the accusations of Satan. And when Satan and his followers were cast out of heaven, were the questions answered in the minds of the universe? No, absolutely not. They were not answered yet. They weren't sure whether maybe Job was correct. Uh, Maybe Satan was correct in accusing God of selfishness. And so what we often wish God would have done is destroyed Satan right then and there, right? Got this over with. But the reality is, if God had destroyed Satan right there, which side would he have proven to be correct? Satan's side. So God understood in his infinite wisdom that the best way to prove himself correct was to let the other side prove itself wrong. Or said in other words, God knew that the only way to permanently resolve this issue and settle the argument in the minds of the universe was to give Satan some time to demonstrate his real character. And then to demonstrate beyond all argument his own character, God himself came to this earth right? The universe isn't quite sure, you know, okay, and Satan's making all these convincing claims that God is selfish, and God says, okay, I'll show you who I am. I'm going to come to earth. And if we continue reading from this paragraph we've been analyzing, it was to give in his own life an illustration of unselfishness that Jesus came in the form of humanity. What is an illustration 
We have some teachers here, don't we? <laughs> what do you use an illustration for? Shed light. Okay, to shed light on helping them understand, helping the student understand a situation. Uh, often an illustration is something you use when you've run out of words. <laughs> You've explained it till you're blue in the face. You're like, okay, I got to come up with something to describe this in more graphic, pictorial, real life detail. An illustration is a graphic depiction of something that words cannot convey. Is that what Jesus did? He ran out of words describing his character. He said, I need an illustration. I need to come to earth and demonstrate real life what my character is like. Was it unselfish of Jesus to give up heaven and come to this earth? <laughs> that would be the understatement of all time, right? There was nothing more that God could do to demonstrate the correctness of his position. There was nothing more that God could do to demonstrate his real character after Jesus had finished his work on this earth. Jesus gave everything. And when Jesus was done, Satan had no more arguments against him, right? I, it, it was settled in the minds of the universe as to the character of God. But what about his followers? And there the controversy shifted to us. So if we continue reading, it was in his own life, it was to give in his own life an illustration of unselfishness that Jesus came in the form of humanity. That's what he came here and did. And all who accept this principle are to be workers together with him in demonstrating it in practical life. Jesus said, if any man will follow me, let him first do what? Deny himself. Deny himself. Many times we say take up his cross, but he said first, deny himself. We like to focus on the sacrifice. I'll carry that cross. I'll get this work done. He said, no, no, no. First, you need to deny yourself demonstrate unselfishness, live a life like that of Jesus. So now in this great controversy, the ball is in our court, so to speak. Here on this earth, God has allowed Satan to continue demonstrating his character, and he lets us, just as he gave the job to Job, he gives to us the responsibility of demonstrating the character of God. That's a pretty high honor, and that's a solemn responsibility. We don't have the power to do in our own strengths. He wants us to demonstrate by the way we live and the decisions we make that there's such a thing as unselfishness. Did we understand that? <laughs> Let me say that again. He wants us to demonstrate by the way we live and the decisions we make that unselfishness exists. You know, the Bible calls it it says that we are made a spectacle to men and angels, right? The, the, the word used there is like a theater. How many have ever been to a theater and seen the spotlight turned on somebody? Where does your attention go? You're not looking around when that spotlight turns on and highlights somebody, right? And that's exactly what it is. When we say we're a Christian, the spotlight turns to us. And the whole universe starts watching. Let's see if this person is going to prove God's character or Satan's character. Will our life demonstrate unselfishness or selfishness? This is war. And war takes 100% commitment. Certainly we make mistakes. God understands that and he works with us through those mistakes. But being a Christian becomes a complete passion, this unquenchable thirst to demonstrate in my practical everyday life and the decisions I make that unselfishness exists. And so let's focus on this. That is, the Christian's work to prove Satan wrong. Let's focus practically on what this work means. Now, most of you look like you had a really great lunch. <laughs> let's stand up for just a moment. Stretch your arms a little. <laughs> Take a couple of deep breaths. Stretch, get some oxygen into the brain. The after lunch session is always the most difficult one. <laughs> What does our work look like, practically? Education, page 262, the beginning of the chapter 31 in the book Education, I highly recommend. 
uh, in this chapter. I, I think every young pe- person at least should read this chapter. It really sets our understanding of what our life work is. Success in any line demands a definite aim. He who would achieve true success in life must keep steadily in view the aim worthy of his endeavor. Do we want to be successful? (laughs) Do we want to be successful in true education? Do we want to be successful in life? Do we want to be successful in demonstrating the character of God? All these things, what do they require? We have to have a goal. We have to know where we're going. So what's our goal? Continuing, same paragraph, just continuing on a different slide here. The heaven-appointed purpose of giving the gospel to the world in this generation is the noblest that can appeal to any human being. It opens a field of effort to everyone whose heart Christ has touched. (laughs) Did you catch what that just told us? It first of all told us that we need a definite aim to be successful, and then it immediately told us what our aim is. The heaven-appointed purpose of giving the gospel to the world in the next 500 years? This generation. You know, when we see in the life of Jesus, as he came here and he demonstrated unselfishness, what was his ultimate goal? It was to preach the gospel, right? To spread the gospel, to demonstrate the character of God through unselfishness, reaching others for the gospel. And when Jesus left this earth, he gave us a command. He said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And Jesus, by his command and by his example, permanently tied together, bound together, the spread of the gospel and the living of a life of unselfishness. You cannot separate those. You can preach all the evangelistic sermons you want, but if you try to separate a life lived in unselfishness from the spread of the gospel, it doesn't work. Because if we're going to demonstrate who God is, people need to see it in our own life. So who will give it? Who will be unselfish enough to go and tell the good news? From every quarter of this world of ours comes the cry of sin-stricken hearts for a knowledge of the God of love. Millions upon millions have never so much as heard of God or of his love revealed in Christ. It is their right to receive this knowledge. They have an equal claim with us in the Savior's mercy. Now we read this and we say, oh, that was written a hundred and some years ago. It's not really true anymore that millions upon millions have never even heard of Jesus. We have satellite, we have radio, we have all these methods getting the word out there. Friends, I've been to places... I was having a conversation with a friend of mine in rural Tanzania, Africa. I was talking about this. He said, absolutely. I could drive you today to a village, multiple villages, where you mention the name of Jesus. They'd say, who's that? And it rests with us. With who? with us, who have received the knowledge, with our children to whom we may impart it, and I love that, it connects the two, right? It rests with us, but it also rests with our children because we can impart the knowledge to them to answer their cry. And who does this apply to? To every household and every school, to every parent, teacher, and child upon whom has shone the light of the gospel. Did we leave anyone out? Household, school, parent, teacher, child, everyone upon whom has shown the light of the gospel, comes at this crisis, the question put to Esther the queen at that momentous crisis in Israel's history, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And I think about the words of Paul in Romans chapter 3, where he says, what advantage then hath the Jew? And of what profit is there of circumcision? Now, you would kind of think the answer would be at that time in history as the, the, the gospel was going to the Gentiles, you would kind of think the answer would be, well, you know, not really much advantage anymore. But what's Paul's response? Much every way. Why? Because they live longer, look better, and no. <laughs> Why? because unto them have been committed the oracles of God. In other words, unto them have been given a special message. Now, did the Jews fulfill that purpose? Sadly, no. They held it to themselves, believing that God had given them those oracles. They were thankful and grateful for those oracles. They rejoiced in them, but they forgot the purpose of them. It was to share. 
What if Paul were writing that today? I think he might say something like, what advantage then has the Seventh-day Adventist? What would be the answer? It's just another denomination, right? <laughs> no. Much in every way. Why? Chiefly because unto them has been committed a special message for the end of time. Do we rejoice in this message? Coming to church, reveling in the study of these beautiful themes, and we forget their purpose. We forget that it's so that we can give it to others. God accounted the Jewish nation robbers because of their neglect. Robbing him, robbing themselves, robbing others of the blessing. It's up to us whether we will be accounted robbers. Those who think of the result of hastening or hindering the gospel, think of it in relation to themselves and to the world. Even our, spread of the, our, our ideas of the spread of the gospel are selfish in nature. <laughs> Few think of its relation to God. Few think, give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our creator. I was... Uh, speaking with a friend, a young friend some time ago, and I was saying, you know, we're told if we had just been diligent as a people to finish the work, then Jesus could have come by now. And my friend said, well, I'm kind of glad he didn't, because then I wouldn't get to be part of the work. And he left unspoken what I knew was really on his mind, then I wouldn't get to get married. <laughs> He had a good heart, <laughs> but do we think about this controversy from God's perspective or our perspective? Are we making sure we get our good education and our degrees and our nice houses and our wives and husbands and then we'll do our part in spreading the gospel? Or do we think of the pain that every minute this world continues is causing to the heart of God? We should reflect as it tells us in the book Education, that every departure from right, every deed of cruelty, every failure of humanity to reach his ideal brings pain to the heart of God. As the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together, the heart of the infinite Father is pained in sympathy. Our world is a vast laser house, a scene of misery that we dare not allow even our thoughts to dwell upon. Did we realize it as it is, the burden would be too terrible. If we could just see the pain and misery in the world, it'd be too much. Yet God feels it all. God feels it all. And he has put it in our power. Whose power? Our power through cooperation with him. Notice, <laughs> where do we get the power? From God. And who do we work with? With the Lord. But it's still our responsibility to bring this scene of misery to an end. How? Are we going to feed everybody, clothe everybody, give everybody houses and food? And no, no, that's not how we're going to finish the work. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Friends, this is the purpose of true education. Let's just think a little bit about the pain in this world. There's 153 million orphan children Last I checked, it's growing constantly. 40 million people enslaved. There's more slaves now than in the time of the American Civil War. Over a billion children suffering from severe deprivation of basic needs. An average of 15,000 children under the age of five die every day. 50 million children are refugees or displaced. Over a billion children live in countries affected by armed conflict. In some countries, over 50% of children suffer from domestic violence. Is this terrible? Oh, it's horrible. And, and this is just a tiny taste of the suffering in the world today. Could we grasp it as it is? It would crush us, and yet God feels it all. Every pain, every sorrow, every child that suffers goes straight to the heart of God while many of us sit on indifferent, indifferent to that it is, that the fact that it is within our power to do something about it not by relieving all the suffering, although that's an important work for us to do, but primarily through the spread of the gospel, by living a life of unselfishness so that we can finish the work so that he can come. He has put it in our power through cooperation with him to bring this scene of misery to an end. 
And there's an idea going around, I'm sure you've probably heard it, people say things like, well, it's all in God's timing. Have you heard this? God's in control, he'll work it out the way he wants it to. No, friends. <laughs> if things were going the way God would want it to, there'd be no sin. This is, we are living in plan, I don't know, long after B. He has a long alphabet, I think. <laughs> We are not living in God's ideal, and it is not all in God's timing because he has placed the responsibility in our hands. Peter tells us to hasten the coming of the Lord. If there was nothing we can do to bring about Jesus coming sooner, why would Peter tell us to hasten it? And we are told very directly, by giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten the Lord's return. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature is Christ's command to his followers. You say, that's just not my gift. Witnessing, that's not, you know, there's different spiritual gifts. That's not my gift. You know, you're absolutely correct. It's not your gift. It's a command from God. It is not optional. If you're a Christian, you are a missionary. Not that all are called to be ministers or missionaries in the ordinary sense of the term, and I'm thankful for this clarification. But all may be workers with him in giving the glad tidings to their fellow men, to all, great or small, learned or ignorant, old or young, the command is given. This is our job. So in view of this command, can we educate our sons and daughters? Here we're getting to the essence of the purpose of true education. Can we educate our sons and daughters for a life of respectable conventionality? A life professedly Christian, but lacking his self-sacrifice. A life on which the verdict of him who is truth must be, I know you not. Now this is a mouthful there, respectable conventionality. What's that all about? Well, whatever it is, it is a life on which the verdict of Jesus is, I know you not. So whatever it is, I definitely don't want it. <laughs> and I don't think any of us do. What is respectable conventionality? I went to the dictionary, I looked up conventionality. It was defined as a conventional practice or adherence to conventions. Dictionaries are so helpful, aren't they? <laughs> okay, so what's a convention? A convention is a custom or way of acting or doing things that is widely accepted and followed, used and accepted by most people, usual or traditional. Ah, uh, okay. So it's just normal, right? It's the way everybody does it. And you say, but I'm not normal. I don't do things the way everybody does it. Wait a minute. It said respectable conventionality. Respectable, considered to be good, correct, or acceptable. We like to pride ourselves on being correct, don't we? <laughs> Let's make this really, really practical. Let's define conventionality. Probably would look something like you go to school, graduate, you get a job, get married, buy a house, raise a family, work hard, go on some family vacations, retire, enjoy the grandkids, and when you die, you leave your money to a good cause. About right? That's conventionality. That's, you know, what everybody does. The American dream. <laughs> okay, so let's take conventionality. Let's make it respectable. You go to a Christian school. You get good grades. You graduate with honors. You get a good job, maybe a job for the church. You marry a good Christian, you buy a house in a good neighborhood, you raise a Christian family, you work hard, you sacrifice some family vacations and go on mission trips. When you retire, you give some more time to the church, you enjoy the grandkids, and when you die, you leave your money to the church. We've taken the conventional and made it respectable. And you say, what's wrong with that? That looks like a pretty good life. I didn't say anything was wrong with it. But Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, I want to vomit you out of my mouth. This is Laodiceanism. As I've studied this term, respectable conventionality, I realize it's just another term for Laodiceanism. It's living the normal lifestyle, but we just Christianize it. And friends, Christianizing normal causes Jesus to want to vomit us out of his mouth. And what's really sad is the very next paragraph says, thousands are doing this. They think to secure for their children the benefits of the gospel while they deny its spirit. There's a lot in that. 
We like the benefit. We like to eat our cake and or have our cake and eat it too, right? <laughs> Want the benefits of the gospel. It looks good, and, and you go to church, and you have good friends, and you benefit from that, you know, the music and the, all these sorts of things, but we deny its spirit. But this cannot be. Those who reject the privilege of fellowship with Christ in service reject the only training. What kind of training? The only training that imparts a fitness for participation with him in his glory. And we saw yesterday Those who fail to understand true education will not have a place in heaven, right? This is also a qualifier for heaven, leading me to believe (laughs) that that fellowship with Christ in service is true education. They reject the training that in this life gives strength and ability of character. Are we grasping that? Those who reject the privilege of fellowship with Christ in service. And again, I want to be clear, that's not all missionary to Africa. This is every day, daily, fellowship with Christ and service and the decisions and actions that we make are rejecting the only training that imparts a fitness for participation with him in glory. Look, if you want to be a doctor, but you didn't want to go through med school, so you went and you got your education degree instead, and you went to a hospital and asked for a job, would you get accepted? Highly unlikely. I hope not, actually. (laughs) Why? Because the only training for being a doctor is to study how to be a doctor, not something else, right? So Jesus says, if you want to prepare for heaven, the law of heaven, as we've seen, Jesus said, the entire law hangs upon the principle of unselfishness. So if you want to prepare for heaven, you better start right now in engaging in unselfish service. Now let's apply this very concretely and practically to education. I'm just going to read this statement, and I'll let you take the application. Even in seeking a preparation for God's service, many are turned aside by wrong methods of education. Notice, did they start off wanting to serve the Lord? Yes. Yes. So we're not talking about people out in the world here. We're talking about those who want to serve the Lord, but they're turned aside by wrong methods of education. Now we're going to see a description of these wrong methods. Life is too generally regarded as made up of distinct periods, the period of learning and the period of doing, of preparation and achievement. How true is that? In preparation for a life of service, the youth are sent to school to acquire knowledge by the study of books. But we saw, right, you can't just study books without applying it in real life. Cut off from the responsibilities of everyday life, they become absorbed in study and often lose sight of its purpose. The ardor of their early consecration dies out. And what happens? Upon their graduation, thousands find themselves out of touch with life. They have so long dealt with the abstract and theoretical that when the whole being must be roused to meet the sharp contest of real life, they are unprepared. Instead of the noble work they had purposed, their energies are engrossed in a struggle for mere subsistence. Wow, doesn't that describe the lifestyle of the majority of people today? And what happens? What's the result? The world is robbed of the service it might have received And God is robbed of the souls he longed to uplift and noble and honor as representatives of himself. Friends, this is a wrong plan of education. Is there a better method? (laughs) Keep reading. In this work, as in every other, skill is gained in preparation for the work. In the work itself, is there a purpose for preparation, a place for preparation? Absolutely, for study and understanding, but we've got to be applying it. And skill is gained in the work itself. Is by, it is by training in the common duties of life and in ministry to the needy and suffering that efficiency is assured. Without this, the best men efforts are often useless and even harmful. It is in the water, not on the land, that men learn to swim. <laughs> Any of you good swimmers? Did, did you learn by practicing in the living room? <laughs> But I want to take us back to this statement that we've been analyzing. In view of this command, can we educate our sons and daughters for a life of respectable conventionality? We've analyzed that term, and it continued to define it, saying a life professedly Christian. These aren't worldlings. These are professing Christians. But missing something. It says lacking self-sacrifice. Is that what it says? His self-sacrifice. In other words, a certain kind of self-sacrifice that is lacking. 
So are there different types of, un, of unselfishness, of self-sacrifice? It's Jesus' self-sacrifice that we need. So what is Jesus' self-sacrifice? Let's think about this. Did Jesus have to give up his video games? You say, well, they didn't have video games. <laughs> no, you understand what I'm saying? Did Jesus have to give up something vile? Was that a sacrifice that he made? No. Did he have to give up his pornography? Did he have to give up his unhealthy food? Did Jesus have to give up his life of drugs and violence and living on the street? No, that wasn't what Jesus gave up. Did Jesus give up something miserable for something better? Did Jesus give up something bad for something good? No. Sometimes we think we're the greatest of self-sacrificing martyrs when we give up our unhealthy lifestyle to follow Jesus. No, those things are just for our happiness. Friends, Jesus left heaven for us. That was not a fair trade. Jesus left light and happiness for darkness and sadness. Jesus left love and came to hatred. Jesus left those who understood him and came to those who misunderstood and misrepresented him. Jesus left a place where they all obeyed and served him and came to a place where they disobeyed him and he served them. Jesus left the adoration of angels to come and be spat upon. Jesus gave up something infinitely good to serve others. That's Jesus' self-sacrifice, and that's what we need. To give up our bad habits and unhealthy lifestyle and the food that we like is, is the first step. <laughs> that's important. That's part of following Jesus. But giving up those things are for our own good and happiness. But when Jesus says that if we follow him, we'll need to deny ourselves, he's first calling us to give up the sinful habits, but then he may call us to give up something good for the salvation of others. That's Jesus' self-sacrifice. He might call us to give up that schooling that we want so that we can serve him in the mission field. He might call us to give up that degree so that others may know of Jesus. He may call us to give up a comfortable job so that we can focus on saving souls so that others will have a place in heaven. He may call us to give up a nice house so that others may have a mansion in glory. He may call us to give up having enough money so that others can have eternal riches. It's different for different people. But Jesus may call us to give up something that's not bad so that others can be saved. That's our reason to be here. That's part of finishing the work on this earth. It's part of proving Satan wrong. I just came across this recently. Study Christ's definition of a true missionary. You wanna know what a missionary is? Ask yourself, am I a missionary? Here's the definition. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Following Christ, as spoken in these words, is not a pretense, a farce. Jesus expects his disciples to follow closely in his footsteps, enduring what he endured. Are we ready to endure what he endured? Suffering what he suffered? Overcoming as he overcame. He is anxiously waiting to see his professed followers revealing the spirit of self-sacrifice. That hits home, doesn't it? But what will happen when we do this? It was John Wesley who said, give me 100 men who love only God with all their heart and hate only sin with all their heart and we will shake the gates of hell and bring in the kingdom of God in one generation. And yet, will this all be doom and gloom? <laughs> is this uh, the sacrifice that Jesus calls us to? Is this all going to make us all sad and miserable all the time? No. We read in our life here, earthly sin restricted though it is, the greatest joy and the highest education are in service. Who wants to be happy? About four of you want to be happy. Who wants to be happy? <laughs> It says our greatest joy is in service. Who wants higher education? I don't expect all of you to raise your hand because we're like, oh, I'm not really sure. No. <laughs> Who wants heavenly higher education? Our greatest education is in service. And in the future state, it is in service that our greatest joy and our highest education will be found. Doing it here is just preparing us for heaven. 
The year was 1832, and the boy was 10 years old. He was on his way to work in a cotton factory in Blantyre, Scotland, because, well, that's just what you did when you were 10 years old and the son of a poor family in Blantyre. It's what his brothers did and most of his family. You had to help pay the bills. They paid a reasonable income, and in all likelihood, he would end up working there the rest of his life. He'd meet a girl at the factory, no doubt, get married, have some kids, and carry out an honest, though poor, existence right there in Blantyre. This boy was different, though. Not that he saw a future in anything greater than working in the cotton factory, but he was determined to improve what he could. He had been raised in a family that taught him of the Lord, and they taught him that God had a calling on his life. They taught him to have a purpose, to not live for himself, but to live for the Lord. And this boy sure had some purpose. It wasn't long before he started bringing books to work, propping up a book on the mill he was working at. He'd catch a sentence or two as he went past. Working in a cotton factory was not easy. It was 14 hours a day, six days a week. It exhausted most men, let alone boys. But this boy wasn't going to let exhaustion stop him because he had a purpose. At 8 o'clock, when he got off work, he went to night school until 10 p.m., then studied at home until his mother blew out the candle at midnight and made him go to sleep. At 6 a.m., he was back at the factory, and he kept it up for 13 long years. He was 21 years old when he first heard the needs of mission work around the world, and though he wondered what he, just a poor young man from Scotland, could do, he now understood his responsibility to do what he could and he decided to become a medical missionary. His purpose was even higher. But the training to be a medical missionary was expensive, especially for him. One session at the school would cost him an entire year's wages. His family thought he was crazy, but they promptly threw themselves into helping him because they understood the purpose too. After two years of working and saving, he was able to begin training as a medical missionary, and it wasn't easy, but he had a purpose. He faced many difficulties, failures, hunger, rejection by friends, and even mission organizations, but he kept going. The devil presented many distractions. After completing some of his education, he was offered another job at a salary 10 times what he was making in the factory. He refused the job because he had a purpose. Finally, four years later, at the age of 27, in the year 1840, he set sail for Africa. There were tearful goodbyes from his family as he departed to the white man's grave, as Africa was then known. Just the voyage could be deadly, let alone the dangers of that dark continent. But he was not swayed from his purpose, and neither did his family try to hold him back. He had a purpose to do his small part in the spread of the gospel. Once in Africa, it required two months of over exhausting overland travel to reach the mission station in central South Africa. But despite the remoteness of the place, he decided there were already enough missionaries there and that more needed to be started in the interior. So while committees of mission boards deliberated about the best methods and location for mission stations, he single-handedly established mission stations himself. He said, if you, want, or if you have men who will only come if they know there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there's no road at all. Time would fail me to tell the story in full. He never stopped pushing forward. He said, I will go anywhere provided it be forward. While others talked of dangers, he said, I'm immortal till my work is done. There is one safe and happy place, and that is in the will of God. On and on he pressed, constantly working with the energy of 10 men. He would stop at nothing to accomplish his goal to open Africa to the gospel. Who am I speaking of? Does anyone know? David Livingston. David Livingston. Attacked by wild animals, once nearly killed by a lion, he faced endless jungles, savannah, deserts, mountains, rivers, hostile tribes, slave traders, and countless other difficulties with unflinching courage. Many times, at the point of death by serious tropical illness, he still pressed on, walking when he could, riding when he couldn't walk, crawling when he couldn't, wa crawling when he couldn't ride, or just being carried. He would stop for nothing because he had a purpose. And in the year 1873, at the age of 60, 
Livingston died from sickness on a hut, in a hut, in the wilds of Africa, on his knees, pleading with God for strength to go on. Did Livingston sacrifice? He lost his family. He lost everything. He was asked about sacrifice one time. Here are his words. People talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Is that a sacrifice which brings its own blessed reward and healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with the word sacrifice. Say, rather, it is a privilege. I never made a sacrifice. Friends, all the law of heaven hangs on this principle of unselfish love. It's the angel's greatest joy. It's the law of heaven. It's what we will be doing when we get there. So why not practice now? This is the goal of true education. Let's devote ourselves to presuming Satan wrong, amen? Let's devote ourselves to bringing an end to this suffering and sorrow and sin. And as the song says, oh, there'll be joy when the work is done, I disagree. I think there's joy while the work is done. We find joy in this work God has given us to do. All right, let's take a break. Three o'clock. What time is our next session supposed to be? (laughs) 3.30. Okay, excellent. Get outside, get some fresh air. You're going to need it for the next session. We're going to dive into a bunch of science. Let's close with a quick word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we have considered this law of heaven of self-sacrifice, please plant, as you have said, you will write your law in our hearts. Place this principle in our hearts, Lord, and help our lives to exemplify your character. Help us not to forget these things that we've studied. Please remain with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, get some fresh air. Be back in 25 minutes.